Bom dia, eu sou o Carlos Saltchuk, professor da Universidade de Brasília e coordenador do Laboratório de Antropologia da Ciência e da Técnica e esse é o segundo seminário Transtec, Transformações Técnicas em Perspectivas Locais. Esse seminário faz parte de um programa coletivo de pesquisas que focaliza o seu interesse nas relações técnicas com o objetivo de compreender e sistematizar a variedade das formas de convivência entre humanos e não humanos, o que podemos chamar de uma tecnodiversidade. Um eixo fundamental deste programa de pesquisas reside em experimentar novas estratégias metodológicas para abordar as relações entre humanos, animais, objetos, plantas e ambientes. Se a teoria antropológica já criticou e reconfigurou a dicotomia entre natureza e cultura, ainda parece oportuno avançar na reorientação da sensibilidade das estratégias etnográficas. Na tentativa de ir nessa direção, juntamente com as estratégias de compreensão, descrição e mesmo de aprendizagem dos processos técnicos, temos lançado mão das linguagens audiovisuais ou visuais na pesquisa etnográfica, incluindo desenho, fotografia e vídeo. Consideramos essas estratégias como uma forma de criar correspondências entre os processos técnicos envolvidos na pesquisa de campo, sejam eles desempenhados pelo antropólogo ou pelas pessoas com quem pesquisamos. Em suma, temos pensado a etnografia como um encontro entre tecnicidades. No caso do vídeo, nossas pesquisas sobre processos técnicos têm buscado ativar de forma experimental as variadas possibilidades da linguagem cinematográfica. Por meio da interação entre antropólogos e profissionais do cinema, buscamos acionar diferentes pontos de contato a depender de cada tema de pesquisa. Diversos filmes resultaram desse esforço, realizado com a parceria do Laboratório de Imagem e Registro de Interações Sociais da Universidade de Brasília. Nos interessa aqui, portanto, explorar os diferentes modos em que seres e coisas podem ser expressos no cinema e em outras linguagens. É nesse espírito, por exemplo, que a obra artística de Rodrigo Godá foi incorporada à imagem desse evento, buscando inspirar e abrir novos ângulos de percepção sobre a relação entre objetos técnicos e seres vivos. Agradeço a ele e a todas as pessoas que participam e contribuem com esse evento. Passo a palavra agora para Guilherme Moura Fagundes, pós-doutorando aqui na Universidade de Brasília, que concebeu e coordena comigo este segundo Transtec, para que ele apresente a nossa conferencista de hoje. Obrigado, Carlos. Bom dia a todas e todos. É com grande satisfação que eu apresento a vocês a nossa conferencista de hoje, Tereza Castro. Tereza é historiadora licenciada em História da Arte pela Universidade Nova de Lisboa, além de possuir mestrado e doutorado em estudos cinematográficos e audiovisuais pela Universidade Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris 3. Atualmente, ela é professora nessa mesma instituição, onde realiza pesquisas e leciona cursos sobre abordagens antropológicas da imagem, práticas animistas do cinema, cinema e antropoceno, dentre outros temas de grande relevância para este seminário. A nossa conferencista possui diversos artigos, coletâneas e livros publicados, dentre os quais eu destaco seu livro mais recente, intitulado Puissance do Vegetal e Cinema Animiste, La Vitalité Revelée par la Technique, co-organizado com Perigo Pitru e Marie Rebequi. Além de nos permitir uma aproximação entre antropologia da técnica e antropologia da vida através do audiovisual, algo que é próprio aos interesses metodológicos desenvolvidos no Laboratório LACT, sua conferência também enriquece o nosso seminário ao evidenciar o modo como as técnicas não se limitam às atividades produtivas, mas também se configuram como estruturas gerais da percepção, capazes, portanto, de revelar movimentos, formas e ritmos. A sua conferência de hoje, intitulada A Planta Inteligente é uma Planta Mediada, nos demonstrará justamente como as técnicas audiovisuais e cinematográficas ampliam nossa capacidade perceptiva sobre as formas de vida vegetal. Bom, então eu convido vocês a acompanharem essa instigante conferência de 36 minutos e também a, a permanecerem conosco para o debate que se dará logo na sequência. Hello everybody, my name is Teresa Castro. I'm an associate professor in film studies at the Université Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. I'm very happy to be presenting to you my research on the mediated plant. My presentation is called The Intelligent Plant is a Mediated Plant. I will be talking a lot about film and cinema, but not only. I hope you enjoy the presentation. After the animal turn, 
which put the question of animal difference, agency, conscious and subjectivity on the humanities and social sciences map, a plan turn seems to be sweeping different fields of knowledge and creation. As the human species sleepwalks into a greenhouse fever of its own making, plants and their singular life forms, for so long relegated to the margins of conceptual thinking about life itself, finally jut out the leafy decorative setting to which they had been backgrounded. Books on the hidden life of trees become worldwide bestsellers and pioneer countries buck the general deforestation trend by granting legal personhood to forests. As botanists and geneticists lose their exclusive grip on the puzzles of vegetal, vegetal life, philosophers invite us to think about and with plants, reclaiming a non-instrumental approach to plant life and taking plants relational and non-hierarchical mode of being as an ethical and political model. Anthropology decenters itself, opening up to the joys of sylvan thought and to the foraging of rare mushrooms. On biology's side, if the idea of a plant neurobiology continues to raise eyebrows, the notion that plants are complex, sensitive, aware beings, capable of communicating and of feeling to others, has gradually imposed itself on the view that plants are less complex life forms, in particular when compared to so-called superior animals. If most scientists will still refute the notion of plant intelligence, contemporary biology seems to have opened up to the idea that plants, and more generally nature, evince at least a capacity to know that anthropologist Jeremy Narby equates with the Japanese notion of kisai, a knowingness, a recognizingness, in many ways, the ongoing exploration and discussion of vegetal life invites us to move beyond century-old anthropocentric conceptions. In our modern world, the intermediation of different types of machines has proved essential to the plant intelligence argument. The communicative, sentient, intelligent plant is a mediated plant. As a matter of course, the history of sciences and pseudosciences encounter with plants awareness of other plants and of their surroundings has relied from the 19th century onwards on the mediation of visual and other technologies. Without this visual and audio scaffolding, our conception of the plant other in sensitive, intentional and ultimately intelligent terms would not be the same. In other words, technologies have made plants awareness and in tuneness with other plants and their surroundings discernible to the rationalist eye. In this presentation, I wish to sketch a brief portrait of this history. Když jste do polohy vychýlíme, najde si brzy svůj původní směr. U ovíjivých rostlin pásmo rychlejšího růstu postupuje pravidelně kolem stonku, takže vrchol rostliny krouží. Pak narazí na oporu, začne se ovíjet. Opora je však krátká. Vrchol znovu začne kroužit a snad se mu podaří zachytit se jinde. S 
zvlačet, jak jej tu vidíme, dovede se ovíjet až plhat i pošikné opoře. Není-li ovšem příliš ležatá. As plants' apparent immobility was a favored old Aristotelian argument against the worth of their inferior vegetative souls, the proliferation of studies on plant motion and plant physiology during the second half of the 19th century mark a significant turn, a step towards the retrospectively surprising troubling of one of modernity's sacred cows, human exceptionalism. Obviously, it had been known for centuries that beyond their still appearance, plants move, and not only under the influence of the wind or due to growing and seasonal cycles. The spectacular examples of the Mimosa pudica, also known as the sensitive plant, or touch-me-not, whose leaves quickly fold inwards at the slightest shock, or the legendary Dionia musipula, the uncanny and animalesque Venus flytrap, whose carnivorous appetites defied Linnaeus' taxonomy, taxonomy, demonstrated this well. Despite this, the sheer amplitude of plant movements remained then still largely unknown, as well as their links to a multitude of external stimuli, light, temperature, gravity, mechanical pressure, etc. Moreover, Western botanical science remained arrogantly deaf, dumb, and blind to much more ancient indigenous body of knowledges and their discerning inklings on plant life and more than human sentience. Toward the end of the 19th century, scientists started using a plethora of motion analysis devices such as graphic tracing techniques and eventually time-lapse cinematography in order to demonstrate that apparently inert plants could move, sleep and were sensitive. Before cinema brought its own spectacular answers to the study of plant motion, revealing the full extent of the non-conscious intentionality of vegetal life, it was the graphic method, more than photography, which confirmed that plants are indeed the active agents of their own fate. Taking part in the in unprecedented broadening of the visible world in which photographic technologies were to excel, the graphic method from which lie detectors were to develop detected what positivist science regarded as truths about nature, the laws governing physiological processes from blood or sap flows to human or animal and plant movements. According to the posit positivist credo, translating these laws and truths into a fantasized nonverbal iconic language the language of diagrams and mathematical formulas by self-recording instruments allowed for the understanding and, ultimately, the relative control of plant movements. As it was expected from any good physiologist of the time, the French doctor Paul Bert therefore illustrates his 1867 work on the Mimosa pudica with graphs that render the sensitive oscillation of movements both visible, including over time, and measurable, in particular when Bert thrillingly puts the plant to sleep using a sponge soaked in ether. All over Europe, men of science rush, rushed to chloroform and to administrate various narcotics to plants, musing on their nerves and irritability. 
women whose upper class representatives were eventually allowed to study botany during the 19th century after endless debates on the appropriateness of Linneo's highly sexual classification system to the decorum of the female mind were generally limited to the collection, preparation and drawing of botanical specimens. For the highly influential The Power of Movement in Plants, Charles and his son Francis Darwin generated a plethora of images conceived with ingenious devices involving smoked glass plates and beads of wax on glass needles. In short, the graphic method, famously promoted by Étienne Jules Marais, was, at, was put at the service of botany. Darwin was so impressed by the results that he concluded in his book that the tip of a plant's radical resembled an animal brain, opening the door for plant animal analogies and igniting the debate on plant intelligence at the end of the 19th century. In the early 20th century, cinematographic technology, and in particular time-lapse, made it possible to reconcile the dissonant temporalities of human and vegetable beings and to manipulate scale. Critics and filmmakers marveled before scientific and other films, which were capable of exposing, by virtue of cinema's expressive resources, the secret life of plants. I'm thinking about time-lapse, the close-up, editing. Tender shoots pierce the ground in seconds, stems feverishly burst towards light, and flowers bloomed in the blink of an eye. The bindweed dance, the passion flower moved and twirled. In other words, plants had become animated, joining the army of inhuman existences that critics recognized on screen. These films seem to resuscitate what botanical herbaria dried and flattened between their yellowy sheets of paper. Whether in France or in Germany, the wonderful spectacle of these films appeared as a revelation, confirming the heuristic capacities of filmic images. These disclose not only the autonomous movements of plants, but also their expressiveness with some believed to constitute a manifestation of a primitive intelligence. One film in particular, The Miracle of Flowers, elevated plant motion to the status of expressive gesture. <laughs> The Miracle of Flowers tells the story of a fairy named Flora, who having surprised a group of children carelessly plucking innocent living beings, i.e. flowers, acquaints them, thanks to time-lapse images documenting the growth and withering of 78 plant species, with the sorrows and struggles of plants, the rhythm of their movements, their feelings. The film's originality relies in the images that Reichmann intercuts with the time-lapse sequences, expressionist dance scenes where human dancers interpret and mimic plants' gestures. The performers in question belong to the Berlin State Ballet. 
directed by choreographer Max Turpin, they illustrate the guiding principles of Ausdruck dance. The expressionist dance movement had developed in Germany from 1910 onwards. The film made a strong impression in Germany, touching film critics and philosophers alike, including Theodor Lessing and Max Scheller. The letter observes on a personal letter that he had seen, I quote, flowers breed, bloom and die. The idea that plants had no soul disappeared completely. Roughly at the same time, in 1927, physicist and plant physiologist Sir Jagadi Chandra Bose published the exquisitely illustrated plant autographs and their revelations, a book on plants writing themselves. Bose was an important pioneer in the study of radio and elect electromagnetic waves, who later turned his attention towards the movements and electrical responses in plants. As he puts it in plant autographs, and I quote, I have been able to make the dumb plant the most eloquent chronicler of its inner life and experiences by making it write down its own history. The self-made records this made show that there is no life reaction in even the highest animal which has not been foreshadowed in the life of the plant. Bose's enterprise encapsulates modern science's aspiration to mechanical objectivity. But his insights on vegetal beings as communicating systems that respond to stimulation through electrical signaling also foreshadow some of the tenets of the cybernetic model. Bose's devotion to decrypting what he calls the plant script is instructive in particular when he discusses the pulsing movements of the telegraph plant. On this remarkable species, a tropical shrub known for the gyratory self-movements of its leaves, he writes, The small leaflets move up and down like the semaphore formerly employed for telegraphic signaling, concluding that, I quote, there is an evident similarity between the automatic pulsation of the leaflet on the telegraph plant and that of the animal heart. Although Bosa was by no means the first to refer to this specimen as the telegraph plant, the media metaphor is worth stressing. The telegraph in the plant's name refers to the optical semaphore telegraphs made of movable wooden arms, which became a privileged means of military communication in Europe in the late 18th century and early 19th century. In plant autographs, Bose refers to the optical telegraph after which the Desmodium girans was effectively named, but symptomatically, his discussion of the electromechanical pulses of plants evokes the mechanisms of electrical telegraphy, which uses the coded pulses of electrical current in order to transmit messages. Moreover, to think about communication in terms of electrical signaling is a portentous affair, since the former is no longer thought in exclusionary, human-centered ways. Perhaps foreseen by Bosa, cybernetics was to flourish in the URSS, permeating not only the discourse, but also the imagery around plant science, as evidenced by several documentaries shot by the Moscow Studio of Science Films in the late 1960s. The film's iconography is here clearly marked by the overwhelming presence of recording apparatuses, such as the polygraph and their simple start graphs or other electronic instruments. Plant communication was taken very seriously in the Soviet Union, where by the end of the 1960s it had become a subject worth studying in the best week equipped science labs. Marxist cybernetic science was globally preoccupied with discovering computable truths allowing for an even more objective and efficient instrumentalization of the world. While hegemonic, this program had little in common with the New Age agenda of the American screen adaptation of Peter Tompkins and Christopher Byrd's bestseller, The Secret Life of Plants. 
mainstreaming Cliff Baxter's thesis on plants' extrasensory perception and their astounding emotional capacities, everything but serious science, the film features all sorts of recording and sensing instruments. Perfectly illustrating New Age's penchant for enlivening perceptions of nature, the picture takes plant sentience and intelligence as a cue to think about the systemic interconnectedness of all life. Not surprisingly, The Secret Life of Plants also makes abundant use of macrophotography and time-lapse sequences. As French filmmaker and theorist Jean Epstein summed up in 1935, I quote, Fast motion reveals a world where the kingdoms of nature know no boundaries. Everything lives. End quote. Beyond their documentary use, the image is produced according to the graphic method, as well as time-lapse films, have a heuristic power, anticipating novel ideas through and thanks to images. Among these, what we could call the plant's becoming subject is perhaps the most striking, in particular when it comes to film. As a matter of course, what these images do is to negotiate a transition from the statute of object to that of subject, what is more, an intentional subject. Again, this is particularly evident when it comes to film, cinema providing a surprisingly generous framework to the other than human, one that is able to overturn the basic subject-object dualism, rearranging the frontiers of the living, extending intentionality to a multitude of non-human subjects, sensing other sentiences, and exposing and suggesting different modes of being alive. This is all the more astonishing, as moving pictures were presented as the celebrated champions of mechanical objectivity, the ultimate means of capturing and possessing the world. But as film critics and theoreticians remarked very early on, cinema seemed to be animism's chief apostle. Indeed, it's as if film images re reawakened other ways of seeing. Instead of disenchanting the world, cinema re-enchanted it by imputing interiorities, interiorities to animals, plants, objects, weather phenomena and machines. Moreover, and this was another topos of film theory and criticism between the 1910s and the 1950s, cinema invites the spectator, a modern subject par excellence, to renew with other ways of thinking. In other words, cinema might be the child of scientific and technological modernity, but it reminds us that we have never been totally modern. Among the champions of cinema's animism, French filmmaker Jean Epstein is perhaps the one who draws some of the more interesting conclusions. As he writes in 1935, and I quote, A surprising animism is being reborn. We know now, because we have seen them, that we are surrounded by inhuman existences. The cinematographer extends the range of our senses, making perceptible to our sight and to our hearing individuals that we considered invisible and inaudible. End quote. Evoking a documentary film on the life and death of a plant, a picture condensing one year of growth and withering into a few minutes, Epstein suggestively remarks that such film, I quote, accomplishes for us the most extraordinary journey, the most difficult escape that man has yet attempted, an escape from our own human centrism. Obviously, Epstein did not have the ecological crisis of reason in, in mind when he wrote this. What he hints at pretty well is that film's capacity to suggest an alternative framework to anthropocentrism, in particular when the mediated plant is involved. Admittedly, the apparent risk was in particular at the time of Epstein's writing to fall prey to a disregarded romantic form of neo-vitalism. But it could be worse. 
It could be that filmic images indulge in that regressive, animistic vice that zoomorphizes and anthropomorphizes plants, forever doomed to the lower echelons of life. Because of their suggestiveness, of their hold over spectators come primitive and childlike in front of the film screen, as many authors believed in the early 20th century, they were much more dangerous than the sober graphs and charts of the graphic method. As French writer Colette writes in 1925, making evident cinema's perilous empathetic emotional powers, I quote, a time-lapse film documented the germination of a being. At the revelation of the intentional and intelligent movement of the plant, I saw children get up, imitate the extraordinary ascent of the plant, climbing in a spiral, avoiding an obstacle, groping over its trellis. It's looking for something, it's looking for something, cried the little boy, profoundly affected. He dreamt of a plant that night, and so did I. So, maybe there's a problem. Don't time-lapse films on plant motion simply illustrate a way of anthropomorphizing nature and plants? Doesn't all this culminate, film-wise, in Disney's silly symphonies, playful but definite misrepresentations of other than human beings? As the voiceover of British Pate production from the Secrets of Nature series cheekily proclaims that some plants are born criminals and that a daughter in the film has no intention of earning a respectable living, aren't we right to ask this question? Don't these pictures exemplify a misguided and insuffi insufficiently critical reasoning, a thought that attributes human predicates to other than human subjects? Isn't their undermining of anthropocentrism fundamentally flawed? by anthropomorphism? I don't have the time to show you the clip from British Pate, but you can watch it on the internet. <laughs> All is well when it ends well, right? But we have a problem, anthropomorphism or anthropocentrism. We should first distinguish anthropocentrism from anthropomorphism. That the gradual reversal of the first relies sometimes on a form of anthropomorphism is not in itself a contradiction, as the policeman for reductive materialism would like us to believe. He whose mission is to enforce polarized and segregated vocabularies for human and non-human. Indeed. As philosophers, etiologists, and anthropologists have repeatedly pointed out, the rejection of anthropomorphism, conceived as a vice of reason since the Enlightenment, stems from an ontological assumption peculiar to modern thought. It was the radical separation between man and nature that bent anthropomorphism to the barely accepted limits of reason and reduced it to a cognition problem common to children and primitive peoples. Understood as a form of generous sociality, and otherwise unknown to Neanderthals, it was anthropomorphism, however, that, I quote, made us humans, at least according to French ethnologists Aude Michely and Charles Stepanov. In our current context, we should be wary of all forms of anthropocentrism, as they seem to promote human remoteness from the living world, holding an aloof, escapist anthropos in his crumbling ivory tower. But as we endorse more caring, communicative and attentive attitudes towards the earth and our other-than-human counterparts, maybe a critical and creative anthropomorphism is not only possible, but desirable as a necessary step. As opposed to a patronizing and difference-denying anthropomorphism, this creative anthropomorphism can be a way of apprehending the diversity and alterity of life and the living, and the means of becoming otherly human. In many ways, to undo anthropocentrism is to decolonize thought. As Viverge de Castro reminds us, we cannot totally fulfill this mission. 
maybe the animistic anthropomorphism that comes with film technology is a reasonable price to pay. I quote Viverge de Castro. People tend to think that animism is a narcissistic, anthropomorphic, anthropocentric fantasy of primitive people, children and madmen, when actually animism is exactly the opposite. If you say that everything is human, then you also must say that humans aren't special because everything is like us. It turns out that film is sometimes, not always, the place where this critical anthropomorphism envisaged as an invitation addressed by images to their human spectators can take place. Maybe, just maybe, as the great Australian philosopher Val Plumwood put it, we need to free up our minds. Also, when it comes to the relations between film, life and the living. So I'm leaving you with a quotation from Val Plumwood, uh, who is one of my favorite philosophers and eco-feminists of all times. Uh, free up your mind. Help us reimagine the world in richer terms that will allow us to find ourselves in dialogue with and limited by other species' needs, other kinds of minds. The struggle to think differently, to remake our reductionist culture, is a basic survival project in our present context. I hope you will join it. So I'm leaving you here. Uh, I've added a list of references uh, that I mentioned uh, in my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Podemos, já estamos... Bom, já estamos aqui, Carol. Bom, obrigado, então, Tereza, por essa belíssima e instigante conferência. É, antes de passar para o debate, eu vou solicitar para a Tereza fazer uma complementação do trecho em que tivemos uma falha na, na exibição é, de um dos clipes do vídeo. Peço desculpas por esse problema e agradeço já ao Luiz Costa, professor da UFRJ em Antropólogo, que vai nos acompanhar com a tradução entre português e inglês no dia de hoje. E já vai começar agora. Luiz, por favor. Thank you, Teresa, for this beautiful and instigating conference. Uh, before we move on to the debate, I will ask Teresa to complement the part of her talk in which we experienced a technical problem in the exhibition of one of the video clips. I apologize for this issue. I thank Luis Costa, professor at the University of Rio de Janeiro and an anthropologist for translating between Portuguese and English at today's event. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to, to present my, my research on the mediated plant. Uh, before we begin the discussion, I'm going to show you the film clip uh, that didn't work, the Czech film. It wasn't meant to be a crash course on Czech. Um, so maybe Luis can translate while I uh, prepare the screen sharing, ok? Obrigado a todos pelo convite uh, para falar sobre a planta mediada. E uh, ela vai agora passar o vídeo que foi, que não passou, que uh, disse que não era uma, não era para ser simplesmente um curso rápido na, na língua tcheca, tinha um vídeo que acompanhava aquele trecho e ela vai passar agora. Thank you. 
because uh, I'm going to stop. I'm sorry. I, I realized um, I had cut my micro, so you couldn't hear the Czech crash course, but it's it's fine. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I want to say um, a few things um, maybe about the film uh, and why I wanted to show it to you, but maybe Louise, you just want to apologize on my behalf because I cut the mic and I'm sorry. It's... Perdão, agora fui eu. Ela pediu desculpas porque ela tinha cortado o microfone, portanto, agora nós vimos a imagem, mas não uh, tivemos o curso rápido em tcheco e, e a música que acompanhava. Uh, então, eu queria pedir desculpas por isso. Um, so, maybe just a few things on why, um, why I wanted to show you this film clip. Um, because uh, you can actually see the more or less complex devices that many of these um, botanists and men of science had to come up with to shoot these films. So it's also, a, there's a whole history of a, a sort of bricolage in these labs. Uh, and Jan Kalabek is one of the most um, famous uh, botanists to have used film since the 1930s in order to do these types of images. Um. Então, ela quis explicar um pouco porque que ela quis mostrar esse filme. É porque é um, é um clipe no qual você pode ver, de fato, os artifícios mais ou menos complexos que os botânicos e cientistas tiveram que inventar para fazer uh, esse tipo de imagem. Então, tem uma história de bricolagem também por trás desses laboratórios e, e desses, desses processos de filme. O botânico Jan... Agora não peguei o nome. Jan... Kalabek. I can write it. Jan... Uh, ok, so Jan Kalabek. Jan Kalabek é um dos, dos, uh, enfim, dos pioneiros dos mais sofisticados botânicos que, que, que desenvolveram tais técnicas. E uma última observação, obviamente, é, de novo, um very good exemplo, não necessariamente de antropomorfismo, mas de zoomorfismo, quando você realmente vê a root growing e it really looks like a, a worm. Então, so just one last observation on that. Uh, mais uma observação que é mais uma vez um bom exemplo agora não tanto do antropomorfismo mas do zoomorfismo quando uh, uh, o vídeo mostra o crescimento da raiz uh, se assemelhando a uma minhoca, né, andando pela terra. So that's it. I'm, I'm, if you have questions, please, you're welcome. É isso. Quem tiver questões agora. Perfeito. Passamos, então, para o debate agora. É, temos já algumas pessoas inscritas. É, como temos feito ao longo das conferências, vamos sempre fazer a tradução do inglês para o português e vice-versa, com a ajuda do Luiz, ampliando assim o acesso para diferentes públicos. Quer traduzir isso, Luiz, antes de eu passar para as questões? Uh, we're now uh, going to start the debate. We have already some uh, colleagues who have asked to, 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 to pose questions. Uh, and as uh, usual, in order to make this as accessible as uh, possible to a wide audience, we will ask uh, questions in Portuguese and have them translated into English, and the answers will be translated from English into Portuguese. Obrigado. Vamos ouvir a Magda. Magda, pode abrir o seu vídeo e fazer a pergunta, por favor. Ah, se, se, identifica, se identifica primeiro, Magda, por favor, que a gente... Bom dia a todos, eu sou Magda Ribeiro, professora do Departamento de Antropologia e Arqueologia da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Então, cumprimento aqui a Tereza por essa fala e essa apresentação tão inspiradora, fiquei muito inspirada pelo seu trabalho, Tereza, é uma alegria é, poder, enfim, te encontrar né, aqui hoje. E eu queria fazer uma, uma pergunta sobre algo que também tem me inquietado, e eu acho que a sua apresentação tratou essa questão de uma maneira muito delicada, né, e muito precisa até, que é essa relação entre, entre arte e ciência, mas a partir 
né, entre arte, vida e ciência, de uma maneira mais ampla, como você demonstra, mas a partir de uma noção específica, que é a noção de grafia. Pensando a grafia não só como a escrita, né, mas como essas inscrições. Então, é, é, as imagens, as fotografias, mas também como você traz essas inscrições na, né, na, na terra, na vida, ou na forma como o próprio Ingold é, localiza, na, na superfície, né? a textura da superfície, e você mostra como é que é, as plantas trariam essa espécie de inscrição, e eu estou pensando também na própria estratigrafia, né? que traz uma discussão interessante sobre a leitura da terra, né? é, e que está no centro também de discussões como o antropoceno, né? e as nossas transformações mais radicais. Então, queria, enfim, te ouvir um pouco mais sobre isso, que eu acho que é um aspecto muito né, belo, né, no sentido da estética mesmo que você nos apresenta, e também muito interessante, instigante. Obrigada. Um, uh, good, good morning. Uh, this uh, professor Magda dos Santos Ribeiro, of the University of Minas Gerais uh, Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. She thanks Teresa for the inspiring talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today with all of you. And her question uh, concerns something that is, is uh, disquieting to her and which uh, Teresa dealt with in a particularly delicate manner, which is the relationship between art, life, and science, but through the idea of graphism, uh, not only as writing, but as inscription, inscriptions on earth, in earth, on the earth, in life, or as angled notes on the surface, on the texture of the surface, because plants seem to carry these inscriptions as Teresa shows. Uh, Magda also mentioned stratigraphy, which also inscribes on the earth. And it's a thing that bears, of course, in the current concern with the Anthropocene. So she would like to hear more on this aesthetics of the inscription and, and of graphics in, in, in plants. Um, Teresa, você prefere, sim, você prefere responder uma a uma ou fazemos em blocos de duas ou três? Um... I, it's entirely up to you, but it might be, I don't know, how, how have you done so far? Um, what do you we think? Can, we can start like that and then after we, we think again. Okay, you can, you can just answer so this now. Questions, right? Responde essa primeiro e nas próximas a gente faz o bloco. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for, for the feedback and uh, the enthusiastic feedback and for the question, which is extremely interesting. I mean, to it's an extremely interesting question to ask to someone with a film studies background, because this problem of the trace uh, of, 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 of imprint is um, at the basis of, of, of thinking about film. Film was classically thought um, as um, uh, a medium that had a sort of privileged connection to the real because it could be imprinted by the real, okay? And so there's a whole, there would be a lot to say um, about uh, the reasons be behind this interconnection between science, life, and, and thinking about the, the idea of something that is uh, printed on, on the surface of film. This is a very general introduction to the, the answer I want to give to you, but maybe Luis wants to translate already this general introduction. Uh, como uma introdução geral, a resposta a Tereza agradece o retorno entusiástico. Uh, uma pergunta extremamente interessante, é interessante de colocar alguém que vem do cinema, dos estudos do cinema, porque o traço, a inscrição, está na base, estão na base do pensamento sobre o filme, que tradicionalmente foi visto como tendo uma relação privilegiada com o real, porque capturaria o real. Então, ela tem muito para falar sobre essa relação entre vida, ciência e instituição, e ela vai dar prosseguimento agora. Ok, so the, this is a, there would be much to say, oh, and we could have a very long conversation on, on this. Um, so the graphic method uh, and the idea in particular that um, uh, there is no human uh, mediation between the plant writing itself and the image that is made is absolutely essential here. Okay, so there is, it's also a sort of uh, imaginary projection uh, by many of these uh, men of science, and I'm saying men of science because they're essentially men, okay. Um, uh, it's also a sort of projection, a, a fiction of objectivity, so there's no intervention from men, and 
plants can write themselves. This is what's fascinating in the in the Sir um, Jagad, Jagandish Chandra Bose example. So the the, the botanist from India, when it when he's um, uh, publishes his plant autographs and all the devices that he imagines again in his uh, lab uh, in India are made so that a plant can write itself directly onto the image. And this is an essential point. And I have a, 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 another thing to say on, with relation to this, but again, Luis, maybe you want to translate. Paulo, tem muito a dizer, a gente pode ter uma longa conversa sobre o tema. O método gráfico, a ideia de que não há uma mediação humana entre a planta, uh, entre a inscrição da planta e a imagem que está sendo feita é essencial. É uma projeção imaginária de homens de ciência. De fato, são homens de ciência, né? Importante não, não, não homens uh, masculinos, né? Então, uma projeção dos homens, mas as plantas também podem se inscrever elas mesmas. E o botânico da Índia, cujo nome agora me escapa também... Uh, por favor. <risos> Uh, quando ele, ele publica os seus autógrafos de plantas, uh, todos os artefatos do seu laboratório que ele descreve permitem que a planta se inscreva ela mesma. Um, so, but leaving this aside and uh, answering more generally the question that you are um, asking, um, of course, there's a, there's a whole tradition also in terms of Western science uh, and, and globally, uh, some of these botanists from the 19th century become extremely interested in this, which is looking at a plant also as a sort of living record of the history of life and the living. Um, and the sort of living record that is able uh, to uh, teach you something uh, about the, the evolution of life, Oh, so the, the idea of evolution is extremely present at the moment. And so they are sometimes going to um, uh, make comparisons uh, between, let's say, um, the way that you see um, oh, the word, I don't have the word in English, but when you see a leaf and you see everything in a leaf. So it's this idea that the very leaf is a sort of imprint record on the history of life. And that looking at this leaf will allow you to understand better, for instance, the very the, the body of a human being or of animals. So this the very idea that the plant is a sort of um, living record of the history of evolution um, is also present at the time, okay? So, but of course, this is connected to a very um, positivist scientific way of looking at these things, okay? So I'm, I'm sure, obviously, when you talk about Tim Ingold, you're opening uh, the idea of, of, of the graphic imprint, but I'm, okay, so I'm answering uh, uh, in relation to these scientists from the 19th century and the way that they, all of a sudden, they start seeing plants in a, in a very original way. Uh, então, uh, deixando uh, a questão anterior de lado e respondendo de modo mais geral, é claro que existe toda uma tradição da ciência ocidental uh, e que e globalmente alguns botânicos do século XIX uh, expressavam essa tradição de ver a planta como um registro vivo da vida, né? um registro vivo que pode nos ensinar sobre a evolução da vida de modo geral. Então, às vezes, eles vão comparar a, a, a maneira como nós vemos, por exemplo, uma folha, e na folha nós vemos toda a folha, né? todos os detalhes da folha, e tem-se a ideia de que a folha é uma espécie de registro de toda a vida, nos oferece uma janela da vida como um todo e da evolução, é um registro da evolução, sobretudo, ligado, é claro, nesse sentido, ao modo científico e positivista, que era comum no século XIX. Né? Então, a resposta da Teresa diz a respeito à, à maneira como certos cientistas, em certa tradição, uh, viam essa questão. É claro que, quando se levanta o Engel e outros, e outros pesquisadores, imagina-se outras possibilidades também. Então, só uma última coisa para concluir sobre isso. O que você poderia, talvez, dizer é que você vê with the graphic method, with the, with the use of the graphic method, at the same time, you can almost trace a sort of development um, around this very idea of, of a semiotics of life. So the production of signs. And this is why the traces and imprints are interesting. And so this idea, um, 
nobody, I mean, in the 19th century and even in the early 20th century, nobody is using the expression and semiotics of life. But this is what's, what's coming up with, with these images and with these films. And of course, I mean, now I'm jumping, I'm making a sort of uh, strange comparison, but um, which is maybe strange in appearance, but it's actually extremely rich. Of course, if you think about plants or if you think about, um, let's say the forest, we know that forests produce signs, huh? okay? So this, this is another, another idea and there would be a, a sort of comparison to make between this production of, of signs and the very own enterprise of cinema. Okay, so what I'm saying is more metaphoric and is actually moving forward from the, the problem of the mediated plant. But I'm saying that in this um, activity of, of, of production of signs, in the idea of the semiotics of life, you can also make connections with, uh, with cinema's enterprise. Um. Então, uma última coisa que ela quer falar em relação a isso é que pode-se talvez dizer é que, como método, como método gráfico, nós vemos, de certa forma, o desenvolvimento de uma semiótica da vida, da produção da ciência. E por isso os traços e as inscrições são tão interessantes. Claro que no século XIX ninguém falava em semiótica da vida, mas é isso que os filmes mostram. Então, fazendo uma comparação, talvez estranha, mais rica, pensando em plantas ou florestas, nós sabemos que as florestas produzem sinais, produzem signos, né? Então, tem uma comparação a ser feita entre a produção desses sinais e o próprio empreendimento do cinema, o próprio cinema, ele mesmo. Mas isso nos leva um pouco além da questão da, da planta mediada. Perfeito. Obrigado ao Luiz também pela tradução. Vamos uh, seguindo com as questões. Vamos ouvir agora o Guilherme Moura. Guilherme, por favor, abre o vídeo e se identifica e pode colocar a sua questão. Okay, obrigado, Carlos. É, obrigado, Tereza, pela instigante conferência. É, eu acho que, é, além de te agradecer, né, eu também queria dizer que é, a, sua, a sua fala traz uma contribuição muito importante para esse seminário, que diz respeito ao modo como a, você trata né, as, as mediações técnicas vinculadas a essa semiótica vegetal, é, como é, isso, isso desloca a nossa compreensão a, acerca da técnica, pensando técnica enquanto é, um, um domínio da percepção, ou seja, como que, to, como que a, a, a percepção é tecnicamente mediada. Né? É, eu, acho isso que, eu acho que isso tem é, um impacto interessante para a antropologia e para a brasileira, em particular, quando a gente pensa é, uma certa preponderância de abordagens fenomenológicas, né? que de alguma maneira é, é, buscam chamar atenção para a experiência imediata do sujeito na paisagem, por exemplo. Né? É, e, por outro lado, existe toda uma tradição na França, especialmente vinculada a uma fenomenotécnica. Né? Então, a minha pergunta ela vai nesse sentido mais metodológico, né? se você é, entra em diálogo com essa tradição fenomenotécnica, né? que busca, de alguma maneira, é, encontrar relação entre aparelhos e percepções, né? e como que as transformações nessas aparelhagens, né? nesses dispositivos de captura de imagem, também reconfigura a maneira como a gente percebe essas formas de vida. Obrigado. Uh, thank you, Teresa, for the conference, and as well as thank you, Guilherme, sorry, this is Guilherme Moura from the University of Brasilia. Once to thank Teresa for the conference, and also to say that her talk uh, brings to the whole conference an important dimension, which is related to the way that she treats uh, technic the technical mediations of the process of registration, showing us how perception is itself technically mediated. This has a huge impact on anthropology, particularly in Brazilian anthropology, where we have a proliferation of, phenomen of phenomenological approaches, which deal with the emergence of the subject and the landscape. So his question is in this tradition, particularly in the, in the French tradition of phenomenotechnics, which deal with the relation between tools and perception and how these ways of capturing image affect our perception of that which is captured. And he wonders if Cerisa has dealt with this literature at all and how she incorporates it into her work. Okay, thank you very Beleza. much. Yes. Vamos okay. juntar uma, uma segunda questão para você já responder Quatro. em conjunto. Ludovic. You. Ludo. Yeah, I'm here. I'm putting ah, okay. my, I can't put my video on. You have to do that. I think yourself. Okay. Ah, you are not. Uh, okay. Yes. Libera uh, a câmera do. Libera. Aí, ótimo. I'm free. 
Thank you, Teresa. That was amazing. I mean, I, I know you, you know, I'm sorry, I'm Ludovic Kupai from uh, University College London. And I know your work, obviously, because, um, you know, I've got your, the book there. And uh, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. And so the first part that what I want to say is basically what you talked about was uh, exact. I think it's very, very important because one of the elements that helped me to understand what was going on in my own ethnographic context with the YAM was indeed without filming, uh, uh, going into a different time lapse. Uh, uh, in one of the version of my presentation of Monday, I was actually quoting your paper because I, I, I made a, an animation of the yams growing and literally surging out of the mounds. And for me, I always thought, even when I started to think about that in, in the field, about that images of those films you were talking about of you know, accelerating. And I, I really imagine what the growing of the vines and the receding into the ground would look like. And so thank you very much. That means in a sense that really this type of, uh, of uh, project you're proposing or you're demonstrating can really help us also to understand how the communities we are working with might themselves perceive those movements and how we had to go through that process, historical process that you went through for us to go back to that. So that's my first point. I, let, I, I will leave Louis uh, translate and do that. And then I've got another question. Uh, obrigado, sou Ludovic Kupai, da University College London. Uh, discurso muito da apresentação da Teresa, a gente não conhece bem o trabalho dela. Uh, e a primeira coisa que ele queria dizer é que tudo, uh, tudo isso que ela escreveu hoje é muito importante, porque um dos elementos que ajudaram ele a entender o Yami no contexto etnográfico que ele trabalha na Papua Nova Guiné, é que, uh, uh, seria, é que seria difícil compreender todo o processo técnico sem a filmagem e sem o uso de lapso temporal. Né? Ele diz que fez uma animação dos inhames surgindo e crescendo, saindo da terra. E ele imagina que o crescimento dos cipós e a maneira como eles são depois de, voltam para dentro da terra uh, parecem... É, é Tudo tem uma, uma certa visão fílmica né, nesse sentido. Uh, e esse tipo de projeto, ele acha, o projeto que a Teresa leva a cabo, nos ajuda a entender, talvez, como as comunidades com as quais trabalhamos concebem esses processos que nós descrevemos. Thank you, uh, Louis, for the translation. So basically what I'm talking about here is about the different conception of time that you know, we're facing with. And I was wondering, and one of my questions is that. The second almost connects to, in some way, with Guilherme's uh, question. And that relates to the contrast you make very important between anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism. What I realize is the people, of course, use anthropomorphism term to describe the plant simply because they don't have a separate discipline domain of knowledge, which is called botanic, right? So, and that was a moment for me, even in the form of anthropology of art, when they were describing what we call circle in geometric term as the moon and how anthropologists of art are interpreted the circle. Oh, this is the moon. No, it's because the form is the same. So there is, here's that. But, and that's where I'm going there is, is there a possibility then that what you have demonstrated proves to us that plants do have techniques, techniques of the body? Not in a no trompocentric way, right? But this idea of efficacy, this idea of transmission through history, what would that do to our limited anthropocentric modernist understanding of what techniques or technology is? Thank you. Bom, uh, o Ludovic uh, chama atenção de que basicamente o que ele estava falando é de diferentes concepções do tempo, né, na questão anterior. Segunda questão dele se liga à pergunta do, do Guilherme e é sobre o contraste entre entre antropocentrismo e antropomorfismo, né? E, e o antropomorfismo ele é usado para descrever a planta. Uh, de certa forma, porque não tem um certo conhecimento botânico. Ele fala um pouco da formação dele na antropologia da arte e a interpretação de formas e não de conteúdo. Em certo sentido, se eu entendi bem. Ele usa o exemplo da, da lua, que é entendido como um círculo uh, por, por, por alguns, mas, mas enfim, tem, é, o, que, o que sai uh, uh, primeiro é a forma circular. E ele chama a atenção também que plantas têm técnicas do corpo, né? e acha que o trabalho da Tereza mostra isso muito bem. Eles não têm técnicas do corpo de modo antropocêntrico, 
uh, de, são técnicas transmitidas ao longo do tempo. E ele pergunta o que, que isso faz ao nosso, que tipo de impacto isso teria no nosso antropocentrismo moderno, uh, 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 enfim, que tipo essa tecnologia teria no nosso, uh, nas nossas concepções modernas antropocêntricas. Acho que é isso, eu bem entendi. Okay. Thank you, Luiz. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Guilherme and Ludovic, for, for your questions, which I, I think I can actually connect them uh, in a way you are uh, talking uh, about similar things. Um, so I'm going to start by answering Guilherme and then Ludovic. Um, and I'm also making a short commentary um, uh, related to Radames Vila Gomes Rezende. Who, who made a, a comment in the in the chat about attention, and I think I okay, so I'm I'm going to react to that as well. So Guilherme, yes, uh, phenomenology and uh, techniques. Um, I am not uh, familiar, I think, uh, with the tradition that you, as an anthropologist, are perhaps more familiar with. But I'm familiar uh, with a number of authors uh, who, let's say, from the beginning, from the 1920s onwards, were basically addressing the same question. So they're not saying uh, we're interested in the, in the connections between phenomenology and uh, uh, techniques or perception, but they are incessantly talking about that. And I'm going to give you a few examples. Okay, so I'm, I'm, go I'm going to answer the question of phenomenology and technique or phenomenotechnique uh, from, from the perspective of the film historian that I am. Luis, maybe you want to... So, um, uh... Agradeço as questões do Guilherme e do Ludovic, ela diz que pode conectá-las porque eles tratam de coisas parecidas. E ela vai também fazer um curto comentário sobre uh, a questão da atenção que foi uh, levantada no chat uh, por Radamés. Uh, desculpa, agora não peguei o nome todo também. Uh, uh, fala, por favor. O Radamés Vila Gomes Rezendiz. Tá. Uh, então, em relação a, 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 ao Guilherme, Uh, ela talvez não não, não 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 ela não conhece tão bem a tradição uh, que relaciona a fenomenologia e a percepção uh, do qual o Guilherme fala porque é uma tradição mais antropológica talvez ele conheça melhor mas uh, é claro que também um, uh, uh, os, 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 os cientistas as pessoas com quem ela tá, com quem ela trabalha falavam da relação entre fenomenologia e percepção o tempo todo falavam disso sem parar, sem falar, sem usar esses termos, evidentemente, mas falavam incessantemente sobre isso. Ela vai dar um exemplo aqui a partir da história uh, do cinema, que é a área que ela conhece melhor. Uh, ok, so, um, um, even before film, uh, many discussions about photography, when photography um, uh, was actually, uh, began to, to be used, let's say, in the 1870s, when photography was began to be used massively in scientific uh, experiments or endeavors, people were saying, here's a technique uh, that is allowing us to see better, to see things that we couldn't see, uh, and here's a technique that is reconfig reconfiguring perception, okay? Cinema arrives, and because cinema has the capacity uh, to another capacity is to manipulate time, to manipulate scale, uh, perhaps to an extent and with a facility that even it is even more striking than with photography, people were exactly writing about the same. So film allows you to see what you couldn't see. Uh, film gives you access, as Walter Benjamin would write, to a sort of optical unconscious things that are there, but that are not visible to the naked eye. You can see for long, uh, you can see things in reverse time, uh, you can manipulate time. I mean, it's, it's not only about the acceleration of time, it's not only about time lapse, it's also about the, the very possibility of reversing things and seeing them before your eyes. This was not possible before. And so the, the, the number of film uh, critics, uh, philosophers uh, that wrote about this, in particular in the 1920s, in the 1930s, 
and then the, the sort of I think I think people became sort of used to film and film as a technology a vision became more naturalized became became so obvious and so natural for viewers and spectators that this kind of discourse kind of fades from the 1940s onwards but in many ways um, I think that what these uh, writers are um, formulating is very close to the question of phenomenal technique that you are evoking okay I'm because I'm a, a film historian this is the basis of my my work much more let's say um, uh, than uh, uh, I think um, other uh, contributors from from the from the from epistemology or from philosophy uh, that you are perhaps thinking about. But phenomenology and perception, the link between perception and phenomenology, is extremely important in film theory from the beginning. Um. Então, antes do filme, mesmo antes da, do surgimento do filme, muito, havia muitas discussões ah, em torno da fotografia, né? sobretudo quando a fotografia passou a ser usada, lá por volta de 1870, ah, em experiências científicas. E as pessoas diziam, bom, aqui nós temos uma técnica que nos permite ver melhor, nos permite ver coisas que nós não víamos e que reconfigura a, a nossa percepção. Aí, quando o cinema chega nós temos possibilidades ampliadas, a possibilidade de manipular o tempo, a escala, a escala, e o cinema causa um impacto visual maior do que a fotografia. Então, as pessoas escreviam sobre isso. O filme deixava a gente ver o que não via, nos dava uh, o que o Walter Benjamin chamava de consciência ótica. Nós podemos manipular o tempo, que significa não só o lapso temporal, mas podemos também reverter o tempo uh, e ver a reversão do tempo com os nossos olhos. Isso não era possível antes. Então, muitos críticos do, do, do cinema, do filme e filósofos escreveram sobre isso uh, nos anos de 1920, 1930. Depois, talvez, as pessoas tenham se acostumado ao filme e a visão foi, de certa forma, naturalizada. E esse discurso, então, começa a desaparecer lá por volta dos anos 40. E, mas o que esses uh, 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 críticos do, 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 do cinema, críticos do filme, formulavam se aproxima muito, talvez, a, a tecnofenomenologia que uh, o, do qual o Guilherme fala. né? Como uma historiadora do cinema, uh, a Teresa pensa a questão a partir desses críticos e desses pensadores, mais do que talvez os filósofos que o Guilherme tem em mente quando colocou a pergunta dele. E então, apenas para mover progressivamente uh, para a the, the outra pergunta, mas também para engajar em uma discussão com o comentário no chat, um uh, final exemplo, o close-up. Okay, uh, the close-up means seeing in detail, but it also means seeing, and this was uh, actually uh, remarked very early on, in a sort of almost tactile way. So this makes me think about Magda's question as well. But you see the close-up is almost a, a sort of um, uh, um, look, vision, way of seeing, a way of seeing that allows for a, an extremely interesting uh, perception on a phenomeno phenomenological uh, side, because people could almost sometimes have the, the feeling of, uh, the sensation of feeling the textures of what they were seeing on screen. And this is something that is noted very early on, okay? Um, do you want to translate already, Luis, or? Briefly. Uh, então, para ir adiante, né, com o último exemplo, em direção das outras questões do comentário, uh, o último exemplo que ela quer chamar a atenção é o close. Né? O close nos deixa ver em detalhe, mas também nos deixa ver, isso foi notado muito cedo né, pelas pessoas que, que usavam essa técnica, que deixava a gente ver não só em detalhe, mas também ver de modo quase tátil as imagens, o que remete também à pergunta da Magda sobre inscrições. Então, é, é, o close é o meio de ver que, que permite, que fornece uma percepção fenomenológica aguçada. As pessoas podiam sentir a textura do que viam na tela. Um, so, globally, uh, so to, to conclude, uh, it was um, actually so uh, remarked very early on that uh, the 
the sort of expansion and extension of perception that was made possible by the film camera, uh, of course, uh, was a question of phenomenology, of engaging uh, concretely with the world that is filmed, but also a heuristic thing. It opened up uh, knowledge, uh, things that we couldn't think before, because for the very first time, and this is precisely the example of the mediated plant, uh, we couldn't see it before. And all of a sudden, there's a number of, of possibilities of hypotheses that become concrete. But I could also say it's, it's a way of it's a different way of formulating the problem, and this goes. So this is connected to the to the to the remark made by Radamesh Villagomes Rezendis. Um, this is also we could also say from a more classical aesthetic perspective that this is a problem of sensibility of being more or less sensitive to the world that is being shown to us because we can see it in a different way. Perhaps we become more sensitive and perhaps we become more attentive. So the problem of attention, this is why I wanted to, to also to, to bring this up, uh, is, is very important here. Of course, attention, okay, is, is not necessarily connected to the, to the, to the phenomenal, phenomenological tradition that you are mentioning, but it's another way of actually um, uh, phrasing this, uh, the problems that, that we are dealing with. Attention is political. OK, so the capacity, of course, to look at a plant as um, a complex form of life, uh, uh, if, a, if a plant appears to us uh, as a, a, a living subject that is um, um, capable, as people would say in the 1920s, of expressive movement, the relationship and the way that we, of course, engage with plants can change potentially and so becoming more attentive is also a, a question of, of politics of politics of attention uh, and i am going to move on to ludovic's question but luis maybe you want to translate thank you teresa então uh, para concluir né globalmente isso que aconteceu uh, a expansão e a extensão que foi possibilitada pela câmera é uma questão de fenomenologia de, de, de engajar totalmente com o mundo que era registrado pela câmera. E é também uma heurística, que nos deu acesso ao conhecimento que nós não víamos, ou simplesmente não tínhamos acesso a ele. Surgiram, então, possibilidades, hipóteses que não haviam antes. A gente pode dizer também que colocou um problema de sensibilidade, de ser mais ou menos sensível ao mundo que nos é mostrado na tela. E nos tornamos, então, mais sensibilizados e talvez mais atentos, recuperar o comentário feito no chat pelo Radamés. A atenção, ela não é necessariamente, claro, ligada à tradição fenomenológica, do qual o Guilherme falava, mas é outro meio de formular, talvez, o mesmo problema. Porque atenção é política. Você ver a planta como uma forma de vida complexa, se uma planta nos surge como um sujeito vivo, capaz, né, como diziam nos anos 20, de um movimento expressivo, de um gesto expressivo, então a maneira como nós engajamos com essa planta, com esse sujeito vivo, que nós damos atenção a ela, é político. Okay, so now to, to go uh, to address directly uh, Ludovic's uh, second, second half of the question. So thank you for the remarks and for the feedback again. Um, two things, it's an excellent question and it's extremely complicated. And I want to bring up in particular the question of cybernetics because I did speak a little bit about cybernetics. But one first thing, um, it's a shame that Natasha Myers couldn't make a presentation here because Natasha Myers has actually uh, demonstrated with Carla, Carla Hautek, I think, in a brilliant article about Charles Darwin, that actually Charles Darwin is, well, people usually say Darwin is anthropomorphizing plants. W what I mean is that botanics and very serious botanics as Charles Darwin were also accused of anthropomorphizing plants. And so Natasha Myers uh, suggests the opposite because so she's read in detail uh, The Power of Motion in Plants, which is this very important book that he writes at the end of, the, uh, of his scientific career because he's a 
Of course, we remember Darwin as the main theoretician of evolution, but he was essentially a, a passionate botanist. So he writes this book and Natasha Myers reads him very closely. And she shows that he's actually sometimes doing experiments that he mentions in his book, where he tries to imitate himself what he considers to be the movement of plants and the gestures of plants. And so she inverses the question. She's saying that people are always so unfair on the question of anthropomorphism. Maybe it's Charles Darwin himself phytomorphizing himself, trying to, to, to go closer to the idea of the plant. And so she suggests the idea of involution I N volution. Okay. So if you have the chance to read this text by Natasha Myers and Carla, I think Carla Hautek, maybe someone can check. This is an extremely interesting example. So, and this is a sort of like footnote to what you were saying. So it's just to remind you actually that this question of anthropomorphism is much more complex than it seems. And Luis, maybe you can translate and then I will go to cybernetics and techniques and plants as technique, technical beings. Uh, uh, a, a Teresa diz bom tem tem agradece a excelente pergunta do Ludovic e diz que uh, coisas tem a questão da cibernética do qual ela vai falar daqui a pouco, mas antes ela quer fazer um comentário. Então é uma pena que a Natasha Myers não pôde falar aqui na, na não pôde fazer a conferência dela, porque uh, no artigo que ela escreveu com a Carla Hout a, 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 a Natasha Myers mostra como Charles Darwin, uh, porque, enfim, muitas pessoas dizem que o Charles, o Charles Darwin antropomorfiza as plantas, uh, ou seja, também botânicos muito sérios eram acusados de antropomorfizar as plantas, mas no final da vida dele, no livro que ele escreveu uh, uh, sobre as plantas uh, e que é analisado pela Natasha Myers, um, ele mostra que, fazendo as experiências que ele descreve no livro, o Darwin mostra como ele tentava imitar os movimentos da planta. E a Natasha Myers, então, inverte a questão. Né? O que temos, talvez, seja o Darwin se pitomorfizando e não antropomorfizando a planta. E ela propõe a ideia de involução, se eu bem entendi, né? É, é em evolução. Ah, ah, e, 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 e por isso a questão do antropomorfismo é mais complexa, talvez mais, mais mediada do que do que pode parecer no primeiro momento. Ok, so, so the, the, this history is actually very complex and you can always turn things around and Natasha Myers does this very well. But so about the, the, the idea that plants are, are, capable, are technical beings in a way that's what, what you're saying. Um, this is the argument of, uh, again, it's not formulated in this way, But this is the argument of uh, someone like uh, uh, Chandra Bose, the Indian um, uh, author that I mentioned, who is also um, a pioneer in terms of electromagnetics. So this is actually what he has in mind. And so whenever he looks at the plant, he sees it as a sort of almost, um, how shall I put it, a sort of... Um, uh, a variation on a sort of electrical model almost, okay? So this is why he goes to, to, to why he pursues this metaphor of the telegraph that I was mentioning. mentioning. Um, and of course, I did say that Chandra Bose uh, was um, um, a sort of pioneer of some of the ideas that would later be um, uh, developed uh, in relation to cybernetics, which of course became an extremely important way of thinking about everything uh, after the Second World War, and which had a major impact in terms of even um, You know, the language of biology, uh, the question of inputs, of outputs, of thinking about living beings and life on Earth as a very extremely complex system uh, with feedbacks. Um, and you have in the 1950s and in the 1960s, and from what I can understand, uh, because I don't speak Russian nor Czech uh, nor any of these Eastern European languages, 
Apparently, cybernetics was extremely important as a model in these countries, in particular when they are working with plants, okay? So, um, of course, I mentioned these uh, Soviet films in my presentation, which I have, uh, they're not uh, subtitled. I have a friend who uh, roughly translated them for, them for me. But so thinking about plants as, again, it, it's not exactly perhaps Ludovic, the, the, the sort of technical being that you had in mind when you were asking the question, okay? But what I'm saying is that actually during the 1950s and the 1960s, you have a sort of declination of this idea of the plant as, a, as an information system. It's not, a, if you think that an information system can be thought of as a technical being, I don't know, I'm not a specialist of technique, you are. <laughs> so, but, these ideas were extremely uh, prevalent um, and important. And let's not forget about cybernetics, uh, which still, it, it's still extremely present in terms of language. I mean, I'm always very struck when I listen to biologists or uh, you know, people from the so-called hard sciences talk, it's amazing. Uh, uh, these notions are extremely, uh, these ways of thinking about life are, are, are still very present, so. Um, well, uh, a cibernética, né? a ideia uh, que o Ludovic levantou de que as plantas são seres técnicos. Uh, esse, segundo a diretoria, é o argumento também de alguém uh, como Sandra Bos, que é o autor indiano que, a, que ela mencionou, uh, que é também um pioneiro do eletromagnetismo. Então, quando o Chandra Bose olha para a planta, ele a vê como quase, como se fosse uma variação de um modelo elétrico. Então, por isso que ele segue essa metáfora do telégrafo né, nos escritos dele. E Chandra Bose foi um tipo de pioneiro de algumas das ideias que depois seriam desenvolvidas pela cibernética, que acabou se impondo, é claro, como uma maneira, um, um, um meio para se pensar sobre tudo, sobre isso depois da Segunda Guerra. Né? Então, mesmo a biologia, a vida na Terra foi descrita como um sistema complexo, com retroalimentação, com insumos, etc., como sistemas elétricos. E, aparentemente, a cibernética foi muito importante para a descrição da planta em países como a República Tcheca e a União Soviética. Uh, pelo menos, pelos, ela, que a Teresa não fala essas línguas, mas, pelo que os filmes indicam, uh, uh, é, é isso que parece, que a cibernética foi uma maneira de se pensar sobre as plantas. Então, a... Uh, Pensando as plantas, talvez não, elas não sejam um ser técnico da maneira que o Ludovic imagina, mas nos anos 50 nós temos a ideia da planta como um sistema de informação. E, como diz a Tereza, não sabe se um sistema de informação é um objeto técnico, afinal, o especialista em objetos técnicos é o Ludovic. Mas ela diz para a gente não esquecer da cibernética, que segue sendo muito influente. E até hoje, biólogos e cientistas naturais, muitas vezes, quando falam, seguem falando e pensando a vida através da cibernética, pela lente da cibernética. Perfeito. Instigante o debate, abriu várias questões aqui. Vamos dar continuidade é, ouvindo a Joana Cabral. É, bom, primeiro, falar que eu adorei é, a, a fala da Tereza, o que ela trouxe para a gente hoje. E a questão que eu estava justamente é, pensando vai de encontro à resposta que ela deu. E eu gostaria, na verdade, de... de se a Tereza pudesse falar um pouco mais, porque eu fiquei pensando que, na verdade, quando a gente está falando de antropomorfismo, a gente está falando de mistura de corpos. Só que, contudo, a ideia de antropomorfismo, ela estabelece uma hierarquia nessa mistura de corpos, né? que a mistura de corpos ela é sobredeterminada, ou o polo englobante nessa né? mistura é o humano. Então, a possibilidade de inverter isso, como a, a Natasha Meyers né, faz, lá no, no texto que a Tereza recupera aqui, de pensar um fitomorfismo e talvez pensar nesse, nessa série de imagens, que muito impactada com o desenho da Disney, né? que tipo de humano que aparece nessa, nessa mistura. Não pensar que existe uma, uma, uma sobrecodificação do humano em cima das plantas, mas talvez inverter. E hum. Eu não sei se a Natasha conhece, mas tem um grupo indígena, os Krao, que fazem danças, é, represent... é, danças rituais onde eles mimetizam o movimento das plantas e lembra muito é, a, né, o, o filme, um dos filmes que você trouxe. E talvez ali, é, nesse, né, tanto no filme como que você trouxe, quanto no, no material Krao, 
a gente po possa ver justamente essa transformação dos humanos em planta. E eu também pensei que a ideia de animismo, que a gente, né, que a antropologia é, recupera e revê a partir do descolar, é, ela, de novo, é uma ideia, a gente, a gente entende que o animismo é uma extensão de cara qualidades humanas a outros entes, enquanto talvez né, os povos indígenas que é, é, promovem essa revisão da ideia de animismo estejam falando de misturas de corpo e não de uma possível hierarquia é, nessa relação. Enfim, Sim. vai por aí. Muito obrigado, Tereza. So, uh, Joana Cabral, from the University of Campinas, uh, thanks, uh, Teresa, for the presentation. And her question uh, goes in the direction of Teresa's reply. And uh, she, she invites Teresa to speak more on this. Uh, Joana knows that when we speak of anthropomorphism, we speak of a mixture of bodies. And, and there's, an, there's an inherent hierarchy to this mixture in which the hierarchically enveloping hold is the human. So uh, this is exactly what Natasha Myers does in her work. So it's the opposite of this. It, it's a step in another direction. And the Disney movie, movie uh, that Teresa showed is particularly impacting in this sense. So can we say that there's not, or, or, that it's possible to not over-codify the human in some of these images, that we can, we can perhaps find a, 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 a different way of, of, of of speaking of these mixtures of bodies. She also draws attention to the case of the Krao, an indigenous people of central Brazil, uh, who, have, who, who mimic the movement of plants in a way that is very similar to what Teresa just, just mentioned in her replies. Finally, uh, Joan also uh, mentions that the idea of animism that anthropology has recovered since the work of, of Philippe Descola is again, uh, the idea that, that animism is an extension of human attributes to other beings. But perhaps indigenous people are speaking of a mixture of bodies in a different way without this hierarchy that places the human on top. And she thanks you again for the presentation. Uh, well, thank you so much, Joana, for, for this question. Um, I'm absolutely obsessed with anthropomorphism for I have been for, for almost a year. Uh, and um, So it's something that I'm, I'm always uh, thinking about. So um, thank you for the question because it gives me the occasion also maybe to, to, to give you some more elements of, on my ongoing reflection. And the question that you are asking about perhaps thinking about different human bodies uh, uh, is extremely, that's exactly towards where I want to go, okay? So one first thing is that, I, this is what I say in the presentation, we need to make a difference, uh, even though they sometimes very often go hand in hand between anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism, okay? Uh, we need to uh, think more carefully about what anthropomorphism can be, okay? Um, and so I draw a lot on some ideas made by Natasha Myers because among others, uh, I mean, another reference is Val Plumwood. It's, it's this Australian philosopher that I mentioned at the end of my presentation who wrote brilliantly about the need So when she's writing about the, what she calls um, ecological reason, she's saying we cannot, uh, of course, in the West, abdicate from reason. This is, we cannot become, you know, a critique of modern reason cannot just be let's, uh, let's uh, get rid of reason, but we can perhaps uh, rethink some of the fundamentals of this so-called modern reason. And one of the key elements is a question of anthropomorphism, okay? So she talks a lot about this and part of my work is also inspired by Val Plumwood. Okay, so I, I'm giving you just context on, on the answer that I want to give you, but Luis, maybe you want to translate before I, I carry on. Thank you. Um, então ela agradece a Joana pela, pela questão e diz que ela é obcecada pelo antropomorfismo há, há quase um ano já que ela está estudando esse tema um, e, e, e ela, a questão permite deixa ela oferecer alguns elementos da reflexão que ela vem fazendo sobre uh, o antropomorfismo uh, e, e sobre pensar diferentes corpos humanos então primeiro ela reitera que a gente precisa diferenciar entre antropocentrismo e antropomorfismo, mesmo que muitas vezes os dois andem juntos. A gente precisa pensar no que o antropomorfismo quer dizer, o que ele pode querer dizer. 
Então, uh, uh, ela usa muito uh, 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 tanto o trabalho da, da Natasha Myers quanto da Val Plumwood. E um dos argumentos da Val Plumwood é que nós não podemos, né, no Ocidente, numa crítica à, 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 à razão né, ocidental, nós não podemos abdicar da razão. Tá? Nós não podemos ter uma crítica à razão moderna que abra mão da razão. Mas nós podemos repensar alguns dos elementos fundamentais da razão moderna. E um desses elementos é a ideia de antropomorfismo. Esse é o contexto da resposta que ela agora vai, vai tecer. So, of course, as I also uh, uh, recall in the presentation, modern reason uh, was saying, uh, in particular from the Enlightenment, oh, anthropomorphism is something very bad. It's something that children and primitive people do. And of course, an objective uh, scientific look on the world needs to be very careful. We cannot anthropomorphize, okay? And I think this needs to be questioned. Anthropomorphism can, can do a lot of harm, but I don't think we can actually totally get rid of anthropomorphism because we are humans. We think as humans, we imagine and see things and touch things and hear things as humans, okay? But think about um, many of those prehistorical statues uh, where you see uh, a body of a man or a woman and the head of uh, a bear. Is this anthropomorphizing the bear or is this zoomorphizing men? We don't know because these things very often go hand in hand. So this is where I'm interested in anthropomorphism. And it's when it kind of forces us to ask questions about what it means to be human. I think this goes maybe perhaps in the sense also of what uh, Viverjo de Castro, when I quoted him, was saying about the idea of animism, okay? So if you look at one of these statues, Of course, you can say this is anthropomorphizing the bear, but you can also say that this is, this is zoomorphizing the human. You know, things can be extremely ambiguous, okay? And so it's perhaps this ambiguity and this sort of, again, opening up of the imagination uh, of, about ourselves, because I don't know who was mentioning the, the Anthropocene and many of the questions that we are faced up with, with today, And of course, one of the big, um, one of the big, uh, oh, what's the word? Zafiu, uh, Luis, help me here. Challenge. challenge, of course. One of the big challenges of, of, of our day and age is to rethink about our own centrality in the world as anthropos. So anthropocentrism, we, we need to kind of, you know, deal with this. Um, but we shouldn't uh, uh, get rid of anthropomorphism because sometimes anthropomorphism as a sort of ambiguous uh, statement, as a way of opening up in a way also the human body to other, um, to other forms of life, uh, to other types of gestures. This is what's interesting again in Natasha Meyer's text about Charles Darwin. It's this idea that you have a very old man in his a uh, Victorian cabinet trying to move his hands as if it was a sort of plant growing, okay? So is he anthropomorphizing the plant or again, is he phytomorphizing himself? So this is the first thing I want to say then very qu quickly about, about dance because it's absolutely pertinent to, to mention what you've just mentioned as well. Um. Então, como ela lembrou uh, na apresentação, já no, no iluminismo era muito claro que o antropomorfismo era visto como algo ruim, como algo dos primitivos, algo das crianças, algo que precisava ser evitado. Mas a, a, a Teresa diz que isso tem que ser questionado. O antropomorfismo ele pode causar equívocos, mas nós não podemos nos livrar dele completamente, porque nós somos humanos, vemos as coisas como humanos, vivemos o mundo como humanos, tocamos em coisas como humanos. Um, então, ela pensa, ela traz o exemplo das, daquelas estátuas pré-históricas, que às vezes tem um corpo de homem e a cara de um urso, por exemplo. E a pergunta aqui é quem está morfizando quem, digamos. Né? O, 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 o antropomorfismo nos faz questionar o que quer dizer ser humano. E talvez seja isso que o Eduardo Vieira de Castro estava querendo dizer quando ele falava sobre o animismo. Então, pode-se dizer que, no caso da estátua, está uh, é, 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 se antropomorfizando o urso ou está se zoomorfizando o homem? Essa ambiguidade, essa abertura da imaginação 
da nossa imaginação sobre nós mesmos que, o antro, que, que, esse, que a questão do antropomorfismo levanta. E o próprio antropoceno, né, que um dos, dos desafios da nossa era é repensar uh, justamente a nossa centralidade no mundo, ele, ele precisa encarar o, antropo, o antropomorfismo também, mas não para nos livrarmos dele, mas para mantermos o antropomorfismo como uma afirmação ambígua, uma maneira de abrir o corpo humano para outras formas de vida, outros tipos de gênero. De certa forma, isso que a Natasha Meyer estava mostrando também no artigo dela sobre Darwin, a ideia de que um senhor velho da era vitoriana em seu laboratório imitava a planta, exatamente o que temos aqui, né? uma fitomorfização do homem, ou uma antropomorfização da planta, essa ambiguidade aqui que parece ser, dar potencial à ideia de antropomorfismo. Uh, so, uh, about uh, the question of dance and the cao and the dance that uh, imitates perhaps the movement of plants, again, it's, this is extremely interesting. And what I can tell you about at least one of the examples that I showed you, which is this film called The Miracle of Flowers, so where you have the expressionist dancers in Germany imitating the plants. Um, this was connected in Germany uh, to a of a, a sort of forgotten current that is being rediscovered recently called biocentrism, okay? It's interesting to think about biocentrism, anthropocentrism. This has nothing to do with the Kraho. I'm just talking about the similarity of having dancers that try to imitate the gestures of, of, of plants, if, if plants have gestures. As almost everything in Germany in the 1920s and the, in the 1930s, biocentrism became something very dodgy and very dubious and very bad, okay? At the end of the 1930s, this was basically biocentrism was being used against the life of some humans, okay? But it's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, it's an interesting idea and it's interesting to think at least uh, about the a, a sort of philosophical and aesthetic tradition, of course, again, in German speaking countries, perhaps because Romantism was very important, perhaps because vitalism as a philosophical current was also very important there. But so the idea of bio, biocentrism was uh, present at, uh, at this time. And of course, animism, there are so many senses to the notion of animism. I mean, you can think it with uh, Descola, but you can, you can think about animism. In, in, uh, animism is not a singular phenomenon, okay? Um, I'm not teaching you anything because you know this much better than I do, uh, but it's true. Uh, and again, I'm speaking as a sort of, uh, as a film historian, um, the notion of animism was was important in the 1920s and in the 1930s, and even later, even if people were not using the word animism anymore, but at least until someone called Edgar Morin wrote a book called Cinema or the Imaginary Man, this idea is very present, okay? Um, and animism as a sort, uh, it's not described as the attribution of human qualities to, to things or beings, but it's this idea of a sort of vitalism, a vitalism in, in things that cinema is capable of revealing, okay? So the, the connection here uh, in terms of film theory would be between the, the notion of animism and vitalism. Um. Então, a dança craô e a imitação das plantas é um exemplo interessante, mas a, a, a matéria chama atenção, pelo menos um dos exemplos que ela mostrou na fala dela, uh, sobre a, a, onde tem certos dançarinos na Alemanha que imitam a planta, né, o milagre das flores, se não me engano, uh, que, que é um filme alemão, uh, e lá ele, esse, esse, esse tipo de dança, esse momento, é compreendido como uma corrente esquecida, pensamento que está sendo redescoberto agora, que chama biomorfismo. E como quase tudo na Alemanha nos anos 1920, 1930, o biomorfismo virou algo dúbio e mal e acabou sendo usado contra a vida de alguns humanos. Mas não deixa de ser uma ideia interessante. Uh, vale pensar sobre a tradição filosófica e estética em países alemães, porque ali, uh, claro, nós temos também o romantismo, que foi muito importante, o vitalismo também, e a ideia do biomorfismo estava lá uh, junto com eles ao mesmo tempo. E existem muitas ideias também, muitas teorias e muitos acerca do animismo. Não é um fenômeno singular nós podemos seguir da escolar, uh, 
uh, mas tem outras maneiras também de se tratar o animismo. Então, como historiadora do cinema, uh, a Teresa chama atenção ao fato de que a noção era muito importante nos anos 20 e 30, o animismo era muito importante, e talvez mesmo depois, uh, apesar da palavra ter caído em desuso. Ela chama atenção ao livro de um crítico chamado Edgar Morin, uh, Cinema e Homens Imaginários, onde a ideia era, era central. E, pra, pra, talvez, para a crítica do cinema, para o cinema, o animismo não se trata tanto de atribuir uh, uh, atributos humanos ao não humano, mas uh, sim a ideia do vitalismo né, que, que o cinema oferece, que o cinema permite capturar. Perfeito. Obrigado, Tereza e Luiz. Vamos passar, então, para as perguntas feitas pelo YouTube. O Guilherme vai trazê-las para nós. Perfeito. Uh, Tereza, a gente tem esse público externo né, que nos acompanha pelo YouTube, tem bastante elogios e agradecimentos à sua fala e tem duas questões tá? a primeira é do Pedro Branco, da, da UNB ele coloca uma questão que de alguma maneira comunica com essa última é, posta pela, pela Joana ele diz, ele agradece ele pergunta o seguinte é, na sua fala você se refere ao cinema como um veículo para registro audiovisual da vida vegetal e ele diz que desde Kalker e Lukács há um debate interessantíssimo sobre cinema e vida, em que se discute a vida do próprio cinema, é, com Lukács afirmando que o cinema, abro aspas, é uma vida de pura superfície. Assim, ele pergunta uh, de que forma você enxerga as dinâmicas entre vitalidade vegetal e vitalidade cinematográfica. Né? A segunda, que... a segunda questão... Ah, desculpa, desculpa, Luiz. É... Pode repetir o final. Perfeito. A, per... a pergunta, portanto, é a seguinte. Como que você, Tereza, enxerga as dinâmicas entre vitalidade vegetal e vitalidade cinematográfica? Uhum. Okay. Uh... Deixa o Luiz, o Luiz traduzir essa primeiro, e depois a gente vai para outra. Guilherme mentions that there are many uh, 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 thank yous and compliments in, in, in the chat, and there are two questions that he wants to, to uh, convey to Teresa. This one is by Pedro Bento, the University of Brasilia, who uh, in, in his talk refers to cinema as a vehicle, and, and in her talk, in her talk, she refers to cinema as a vehicle for the audio-visual register of registration of life. Uh, and there's a large discussion on life in cinema, and uh, he wants to know how uh, you, Teresa, see that uh, interpret and understand this dynamic between vegetal and cinematic vitality. Um, do you want perhaps to also to, to read the second question and I can... Okay. Yes, it's better. Mm -hmm. A segunda questão, Guilherme, faz na verdade todas e aí depois a gente já passa para a Tereza responder e encerrar, tá? Perfeito. São apenas duas questões. Essa, essa vem do Evandro Soares, que é da Sociologia da Unicamp, ele pergunta, da perspectiva de uma antropologia dos modernos, é, penso nas técnicas de sensoriamento de plantas utilizado na agroindústria, que produzem imagens através de dados de refletância das plantas e do solo. Né? Essas imagens circulam por laboratórios, empresas, uh, e ele se pergunta se é coerente dizer que existe nessas imagens é uma estética capaz de levar à transformação do modo de existência das plantas. Um, uh, uh, Evandro Soares, from Unicamp, uh, he asked, well, from the perspective of an anthropology of the moderns, uh, he, he, your talk made him think of the techniques of, of sensorization of plants and agro-industry, creating images of plants and agro-industry. And these images circulate within labs and within uh, corporations and companies. And he's, he wonders if it's coherent to say that these images have an aesthetic that can change the way we conceptualize plants. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I can answer the both questions. Thank you, Pedro and Evandro. Um, the question about um, uh, life and vitality is uh, extremely important and extremely interesting and I, I thank you for that because obviously um, uh, it allows me maybe to, to stress something that I do not address at all in my presentation uh, but which is very evident when you look at the, uh, the photographic and the cinematic tradition where plants and flowers tend to be the motive of images. And it's the idea that plants 
maybe again this goes back to the question the first question that uh, that was asked also uh, that plants uh, are a, um, a means of uh, thick, uh, plants are aesthetic beings they are a question of creating forms all the time so plants are very formal huh? they're a form of life and as a plant, when a plant blooms and a flower blooms, there's this idea of a, a permanent creation of forms, okay? So a plant is about a life of forms. This is where I want to get to, okay? The idea that plant life, uh, plant life is not only a, a, um, a life form and the form of life, it's also a sort of almost um, uh, a reminder on this idea of the very own life of forms, okay? Because again, vegetals are extremely formal beings. And this is one of the reasons why so many different cultures and societies are uh, interested in plants. Think about Japan. Maybe you want to, to start translating, Luis. Uh, então, agradeço a pergunta uh, do Pedro sobre a relação entre vida e vitalidade, que é uma questão muito importante. Uh, também. Obviamente, isso uh, vai permitir a Tereza falar de algo a qual ela não pôde se dirigir na apresentação dela, mas que é muito evidente na tradição fotográfica e cinemática, que é a ideia de que plantas são seres estéticos, né, que criam formas o tempo todo, que talvez remeta à primeira questão uh, da Magda também. Então, uh, uh, elas são formas de vida. né? Quando uma planta desabrocha, nós temos formas, temos novas formas sendo, sendo criadas. Então, a vida vegetal ela não é apenas uma forma de vida, uma vida com forma, mas uma lembrança, uma, algo que nos lembra da própria vida das formas. Os vegetais são seres, seres extremamente formais, no sentido de que têm formas, fazem formas, criam formas. E por isso que muitas culturas são tão fascinadas pelas plantas. E ela imediatamente se lembrou do Japão como exemplo. So, but to go back to film, um, uh, of course, uh, the life of plants, the films that address the life of plants are uh, to many um, spectators and writers of the time. So very early on at the beginning of the, the 19th century, the absolute example that uh, films, um, a film cinema has the capacity to reveal life, that cinema, cinema is a sort of vitalist, vitalist medium, and that you can actually think about this in sort of, again, in very vitalist terms. And just let me add something about Lukacs. I don't know what, what's the text that you have in mind when you ask this question, but he's one of the, one of the first um, critics actually to point out very early on, I think it's in 1908, uh, in a text about cinema, uh, to, to address the question of how spectators in front of the screen are going to accept maybe things and ideas that they do not accept otherwise. So in a way, they become less modern because they are able to accept this idea of, of very vitalist ideas conveyed by, by film. So Lukacs is, of course, very, very interesting from that, uh, from that perspective. Um, voltando ao filme, uh, claro, a vida das plantas, os filmes sobre a vida das plantas são para muitos espectadores da época, do início do século XIX, do século XX, Uh, o, o, exemplo, o exemplo maior do cinema como capacidade de revelar a vida uh, e do cinema como um meio vitalista. Pode-se pensar isso, então, em termos vitais. E Lukács, uh, uh, que foi um dos primeiros críticos que mostrou num texto que talvez tenha sido publicado em 1908, num trabalho sobre cinema, uh, foi um dos primeiros a, a questionar em que medida os espectadores são capazes de aceitar coisas e ideias que, de resto, eles não aceitariam. E que, dessa maneira, o filme, de certa forma, faz com que Uh, os espectadores se tornem uh, menos modernos. Esse é um efeito que o filme tem sobre uh, os espectadores. So I, I think it's 1908 or 1912. Um, I, I don't remember exactly anymore, but I can send the reference to Carlos and or and to, to the conference, and they, they can send it to you. So the question that Evandro asked, of course, is a very good question, and it allows me. Uh, 
again to maybe just remind something as a again as a film a film historian and as a person with a background in terms of images and image theory of course uh, when you're talking about um, uh, techniques of sensorization and images produced by the industry in this specific context, uh, um, nobody thinks that uh, these sort of images are open to open up new ways of uh, thinking about vegetals, life, whatever. This was already the case actually with some of the films, um, not necessarily films that I showed you today, but some of the so-called scientific films on the life of plants, when they're, when, when they're made uh, in, the, in the 20th century, they're not made at all with the idea of opening up new ways of thinking about vegetal life, about the relation between subject-object, et cetera, et cetera. But what's fascinating about images, and having said this, I, I open up a parenthesis, I, I, I would need to look at the images that you are mentioning, but I, I think I, I pretty much visualize what you are talking about. But what I want to say is that this is what's so fascinating about images is that they escape the intentions of the author. And to actually go back to the question uh, asked by Pedro, we could argue that images live a life of their own. And things that we are not capable as humans to see uh, today, uh, and sometimes in very specific contexts, can become apparent to others in different contexts, in different times, and people who look at things with, with, with a different just way of seeing. So I'm not necessarily answering your question, uh, which I, I understand that many of the, the, the images produced even today by, uh, by biologists may seem as, you know, just addressing very specific scientific points. And at the same time, so maybe it's a sort of weird faith of mine, uh, but I do believe that images are very often, I mean, they totally escape the intentions of the makers. Uh, and very often they are capable of opening up new, new perspectives. So just maybe to, to, to conclude and to, uh, to, to close the circle and to go back to the first question by, by Pedro. It's also because images live a life of their own, so. Ah, respondo a Evandro, uma excelente questão, e ela vai responder novamente como historiadora do filme, teórica da imagem. Uh, e quando a gente fala de técnicas de sensorização de imagens uh, produzidas de e para a indústria, ninguém pensa que essas imagens vão abrir novas maneiras de se conceber a vida vegetal e assim por diante. Mas alguns dos filmes científicos sobre a vida das plantas no século XX, eles também não foram feitos pensando em abrir a vida vegetal à nossa imaginação. É claro que ela não, vê, não viu as imagens das quais o Evandro está falando, mas ela pode imaginar mais ou menos como elas são. Só que o é interessante dessas imagens é que elas escapam as intenções dos seus criadores e acabam vivendo a sua própria vida, né? retornando à questão uh, do Pedro. Então, tem coisas que hoje nós não vemos, mas que podem se tornar visíveis no futuro, com outros olhos, por outras pessoas. Então, Teresa diz que ela entende que muitas das imagens produzidas por biólogos têm uma finalidade científica, mas ela crê também que imagens escapam as intenções dos criadores e acabam por abrir novas perspectivas. Para concluir, então, fechar o ciclo aqui e, e, e recuperar também a questão do Pedro, as imagens vivem a sua própria vida. Maravilha. Bom, obrigado, Teresa. É, foi mencionado aqui pela Teresa que Uh, a Natasha Myers uh, tinha uma conferência prevista nesse evento, infelizmente ela não pôde realizar essa conferência, né, por um acontecimento pessoal. É, nós convidaremos ela para fazer uma apresentação nos seminários do Laboratório de Antropologia da Ciência e da Técnica, quando isso for possível, e convidaremos a, a todos para é, estarem presentes. É, quer traduzir isso, Luiz? Depois eu vou para o fechamento. Uh, thank you, Teresa. And, uh, he... Uh, uh, Carlos would like to, to, to uh, bring to attention that Natasha Myers was scheduled to speak, but sadly she was unable to, to participate due to personal reasons, but she will be invited to meetings of the lab in the future when this becomes possible. Ótimo. É, bom, para finalizar, eu agradeço muito a belíssima apresentação e disposição para o debate da Tereza, ao Luiz pelo, 
incrível, incrível capacidade de tradução, memorização. É, bom, é, acho que esse debate nos, nos ah, mostrou de uma maneira bastante profunda e fascinante a maneira é, como esses debates é, que estão ocorrendo e podem ser mobilizados no cinema e na antropologia é, interpelam né, uma discussão mais ampla, filosófica e mesmo política sobre a relação entre humanos e plantas. Esse debate, obviamente, nos situa no cerne da relação entre técnica e vida, né? que o pensamento moderno, na verdade, aparta em grande medida, mas as práticas, a todo momento, promovem interpenetrações é, que nós enfim, podemos discutir hoje. Um dos impactos mais específicos disso para o debate da antropologia é nos levar a repensarmos, a partir do recurso audiovisual, a maneira como temos e como podemos etnografar as relações entre plantas e humanos. É, com isso, então, eu, eu termino a, a sessão de hoje, agradecendo a todo mundo que participou, convidando a todos e todas para a sequência dessa conferência, sobretudo a, a, a conferência do Timingo, prevista para amanhã, nesse mesmo horário, que será também transmitida pelo YouTube. Luiz, você quer fazer essa tradução antes da gente encerrar? Uh, so, Carlos, thanks uh, all of you for the wonderful presentation. Thanks, Teresa, for the wonderful presentation. Everyone for the debate, and, and Louis, me for the translation. Uh, and the debate, uh, uh, Carlos uh, um, uh, says, shows us in a fascinating way uh, how these these conversations are mobilized, that are mobilized in cinema and anthropology, that are that are engaged in cinema and anthropology, can interpolate humans and plants. They are at the very heart of the relation between life and techniques. Uh, and many more uh, specific um, points for anthropological debate, but the more specific uh, impact of all this for the anthropological debate is for us to think uh, of how we can do ethnography of humans and plants through audiovisual means. So thank you everyone. And Carlos would like to invite everyone to stay on for the workshop and to be here tomorrow for Tim Ingold's uh, conference, which will start at 10 a.m. Is that right, Carlos? Yes, exactly. Muito obrigado a todos, então, e vamos encerrar a sessão de hoje. Tchau, Obrigada. Tchau.